little to no talking, which I love. I just screen the question, or I just point and say, as you're asking the question. Um, but in any event, um, we have a distinguished panel, and I'd like for them to introduce themselves and maybe name some of their favorite books in this category. Since you're handing me the mic. Now, last year I did not talk into the mic and they yelled at me for it. So. Uh, my name is Christopher Elliott and I am the acquisitions librarian for Southeast Public Library System in Oklahoma. I used to be the YA librarian. In fact, during the summer, our teen librarian quit during the middle of the submarine program and I got snatched back into that. And they played something called Yu Gi Oh! And I had no idea how to play Yu Gi Oh! But I was a quick learner. Um, I purchase uh, everything for our library, and that includes the YA. And as far as favorite books, I would say everything on here is good in their own way. But two of my favorites is Proxy by Alex Lund London, awesome book. And one that I read recently, Grasshopper Jungle, awesome book. It, it is a very good book. I'm Sue Williams Chima, and I write teen fantasy novels. Um, this is my latest one out in the Air Chronicles, and I have another one coming out in October, The Sorcerer Air. Uh, my other series is The Seven Realms, um, and I am, you are among the first to know that I'm going to be writing four more books set in The Seven Realms. As far as um, books with um, sexually diverse characters that I like, um, I, I did read just recently Grasshopper Jungle and I thought it was, um, it was an unusual niche for the um, gay character to, to, to play and I um, like that a lot. I like Cassandra Clare's fantasy. Um, I, um, Melinda Lowe's books um, are all excellent. Um, what else? Um, I guess that's a start. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephanie Perkins, and uh, my most recent book is Isla and Happily Ever After. I write contemporary young adult romance, and I also have a holiday anthology um, that does feature uh, gay couples in it coming out in October. It's called My True Love Gave to Me. And uh, my favorite books um, with LGBTQA characters this year are um, actually, Christopher, I saw you had one of them in your stack. It's David Levithan's Two Boys Kissing, if you hold that one up. Um, since I write contemporary, I'll, I'll mention my favorite contemporary ones. I loved that one. It's really, really, really great. Um, and then another one that I did not see in your stack, my very favorite love story this year was written by Nina LaCour. And uh, she shares an editor with me. My editor is Julie Strauss Gable, who also did Grasshopper Jungle. She's an amazing editor. The book is Nina LaCour's Everything Leads to You, and it's a love story about two ladies. And it has uh, zero drama. It's just a really, really good love story. It's not about people being angry or having to get over anything. It's just a really, really beautiful love story. Everything leads to you, Nina LaCour. You should totally read it. <laughs> I'm Nessa Warren. I am the YA coordinator for Harmony Inc. Press, which is a publisher of exclusively LGBTQ plus young adult fiction. Um, so I'm the one who, like, I read all our submissions, I run our social media, all of that. Um, my favorite books, I don't think I'm allowed to pick one of ours because then the authors get mad at me if I say I like one more than the others. Um, something not published by us would be Melinda Lowe. Um, I, I really like her stuff. So. I'm Casey. I'm one of the YA Lit staffers. Um, as far as my favorite books lately, um, so I will actually second Two Boys Kissing uh, and actually anything David Lovren's written, including Will Grayson, Will Grayson, which he wrote with John Green. It's a re re right? It's really good. <laughs> um, also, I'm biased because he's a really good friend of mine, but Steve Berman just released a book of uh, gay YA fairy tales, and there's a couple of copies down there. It's called Red Caps. It's really good. Um, and uh, I recently read a few books that have some really interesting um, trans side characters, which I loved. Um, Libba Bray's Beauty Queens, and Holly Black's The Coldest Girl in Cold Town. Yeah. 
Okay, so how we usually run this panel is um, you're free to ask questions at any time. I'll start just to get us going, but if you have anything to ask, just pop your hand up and I will call, and that's how we'll go. Um, the first question is, um, how do you classify what? How do you classify this category of books? Do you, what would you classify it as? I guess. Like, what makes it LGBTQA? The characters. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, what's this the publisher answer? Well, for us, it is. I mean, we want main characters who identify as LGBTQA. Um, we. So, and, and we actually want main characters um, in the industry. Uh, you can also classify if they have major side characters. I mean, it doesn't really count if you've got that guy that appears on page 36 for two lines. Um, but you know, a, a, like you know, the, the person's best friend or something that can also be included, um, or or issue books. Um, but the story doesn't have to revolve around the issues. A lot of what we publish does not revolve around the issues. We publish fantasy and paranormal and just contemporary. You know, love stories that just that don't revolve around. They just happen to star a LGBTQA character. Yeah, Melinda Lowe, um, which a lot of people say they'd love, which I do too, uh, is really keen on now that LGBTQ novels should have the protagonist be LGBT. Now, it may not be a coming out novel or a realistic novel. It could just be that's what they are. But that she's really big that we're past the stage of the gay best friend where that could be classed as a LGBT novel. I mean, that may have worked in 1989, but it doesn't work today. And so although that person may be portrayed in a positive light, which is always good, uh, we're now to a point where the main protagonist needs to be LGBTQ in some way. And um, so when you see numbers like I have on the handouts of, you know, 249 some odd, you know, books, keep in mind that's even, as she said, where on page 137 the person appears for two lines. And they count that. But Melinda Lowe, which is in that yellow handout, she's only counting the big publishers in which the main protagonist is. And that is a lot smaller. And um, uh, in the terms of the publishing field, especially among the main publishers. So. Yeah, and Melinda's um, really spearheading the diversity in YA campaign online, if you guys have heard of that. So that's why um, I think you're probably singling her out, because she really is um, very well spoken on the subject. So that's a really great hashtag to follow on Twitter or, and Tumblr. Just so you know, I always resist um, categorization of books because um, you know, it's like when you read the, when you see the article where the agents and the editors have all come up to say what the next big thing is, and we don't really know what the next big thing is until readers tell us. So um, I would use a a broader term, not um, labeled as LGBTQA, but um, work that. Um, is diverse enough of work that reflects our world as it actually exists with people of um, many different sexual orientations included in the cast of characters. Um, so I think there are a lot of different ways that you can be supportive of diversity, um, whether it be having a gay person as a main character or um, including them in your overall cast of characters. I would actually really love to see more books that are less issue books, less coming out stories, and more just stories <laughs> where the characters... The issue really books the don't sound. <laughs> oh, well, that's probably true as well. Right? But like, take any of your favorite YA stories and just think about how the story would be different if the main character were gay instead of straight, and would it really change the story? It might change the gender of the love interest, but otherwise the story would be exactly the same. And I would love to see more of those, just adventure stories and romance stories and you know that aren't about coming out, that aren't about issues, and just that's the story. I did want to add one more thing. The overwhelming amount of this fiction is the white gay male. 
and as Melinda Lowe and others are trying to spearhead in, in diversity, it's getting more where you know trans uh, characters or, or or lesbian or pansexual um, or or something like that. Because, like I said, even though this is a small market, the lion's share is the white gay male in the story, and that's another diversity to work on. I have a friend who's um, active in the area of diversity in literature when it comes to race, and what she often says is, where is our black Ramona Quimby? You know, where is our black Harry Potter? And so, um, to speak to the comment that you made, um, you know, a story, I think um, agenda almost always damages story, and if the focus of your book is to push some sort of agenda or, you know, so-called problem books, then you usually end up with a less appealing story, which, you know, when you say that issue books don't sell, it's understandable. So um, I think focusing on story and peopling it with characters that reflect our diverse world um, would be a really appealing approach. Well, and, and people who want to read these books, a lot of people who identify as LGBTQA, they've already gone through all the drama of coming out. They've gone through all the drama of their parents not supporting them or their grandparents or their teachers or whoever. They've gone through all, all of that drama that shows up in the issue books and they want to read to escape. They want to go to a place when they read where it's it's okay and it's great and it's, you know, they, they just want to see themselves reflected in that. So I, it, it, that's very important. and. You know, as the person who reads the submissions for our press, I can tell you that my standards for a story that feature a white cis gay male are so much higher than a story that has any other kind of protagonist. Because <laughs> these stories with other kinds of protagonists are worth us putting more editing effort into. We had a question right here. Just a really quick question. Every year another letter gets put onto the head. <laughs> what is the A for? Asexual. Asexual. Thank you. Do you guys know about novels with asexual, so I can only think of one with like a side character, but I... Guardian of the Dead. Guardian, exactly, <laughs> Guardian of the Dead by Karen Healy. Yeah. Uh, RJ Anderson wrote one. What's it called? Guardian of the Dead. Yeah. Quicksilver? Quicksilver. Yeah. Good. I was like, oh, oh this is a have an ace character as well? <laughs> yeah, um, because when she scored to her goddess, it is triple, I think of the Tricksters. The Trickster series by Tamar Pierce. Okay. And I guess speaking of ace characters, why do you think it's so hard to have ace characters? Because, you know, it would be easy. I know a lot of books that don't involve romance, but the characters still assume straight. Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish we had an answer. I don't have the answer to that. I can tell you that, I, I mean, we, we're, right now we're going through, and I've been advertising over the past several weeks, I've got, um, banners out on Tumblr specifically saying, you know, we're looking for asexual characters, we're looking for pansexual characters, we're looking for gender queer characters, we're looking for all of these much less represented characters, and the asexual one got reblogged something like a thousand times more than any other one. Is there so there's definitely demand there, but nobody sent me a book yet, so I can't publish it. I wonder if part of the reason, it, because in YA in particular, it's actually really difficult to find stories that don't have romance in them. Yeah. Right, we have a whole panel about that, I think it's tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, so kissing optional panel tomorrow. <laughs> um, and, you know, as we're thinking of book recommendations for that, it's actually really hard. And I think it's just because for, you know, for teens, like, beginning romance is kind of, you know, an important thing for a lot of them. And so maybe that's one of the reasons reasons why. Sure. The next question I have involves a lot of participation by the audience, so we're just going to give that experience. Um, what experiences have you had of getting these books into bookstores or into, as in Christopher's case, libraries, public libraries or school libraries, or what has been your experience trying to find these books? I I have been filling up our GSA library. Um, separate from, we have a great library, a really small private school, and our library is very committed to diverse books, not just sexual orientation, but race, whatever. But just trying to fill a small bookshelf so that our kids can see themselves in the stories. 
Um, you go to Barnes and Noble and you have to beg. I go with the list. How about this author? This author? This author? And there's nothing on the shelf. I can find Leviathan sometimes. I can find, you know, everything's Will Grayson, Will Grayson. Um, there's nothing else on the shelf. And that's because that's it's John Grayson. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, one of the things that I found to be really, really nice, I mean, not only for, for finding uh, LGBT stuff, but also for finding historical stuff. So I've been using ILL a lot, Interlibrary Loan, um, which pretty much all libraries in the national systems use. Um, and unfortunately, it's not very visible, and they don't advertise it very well, so a lot of people don't know it exists. But when I find out about a book, I'm online, and I'm like, oh, this sounds like an interesting book, and it's not an ebook, so I can't download it. How am I going to get it? And so a lot of times, that's what I end up doing. I go to the library, and I go through Interlibrary Loan and get the book out. Yeah, do you guys know that in library? Okay, good, yeah. Um, uh, building on ILL, actually, uh, when I was working in archives, I used WorldCat a lot. So if I found something, it's WorldCat.org, either ED or org, WorldCat.org, and, org, and uh, it's, it will find pretty much anything in print that exists. It, it's, oh, I just want to say it's very important for adults, especially if you're a teacher or a librarian, to be proactive because a lot of your YA kids are very shy about Some of them may not have come out or even if they have, it's not something they want to advertise to the world and coming to a strange person to say, do you have a copy of Two Boys Kissing is like, you know, that can be, you know, a, a, I mean, teens go through enough problems as it is. And so it's really important for adults, librarians, school teachers, whatever, to be proactive to provide these books. And then the kids can find them. And don't hide them in the adult section or, you know, squirrel away somewhere. Yeah, actually, um, speaking of that, and this is a really good thing to say to a whole room of people, because I haven't even, but I've been recently been trying to start to point out with being bi. And so then, like, I can't, like, go to my school librarian and be like, hi, do you have books about bisexual people? Because I will say, if you find a book, check it out of the library. Even if you don't want to read it, if it's not your book, check it out of the library because the biggest thing that we get from librarians when we talk to librarians, I just don't know if this is going to circulate. And they're not willing to spend the money because they don't know that it's going to circulate. So when you find them in your library, check them out, show them that these books circulate, and then they will buy more. Um, my coworker actually runs the bisexual books blog on Tumblr, so you should check that out because it has tons of recommendations and she's always reading more and more books. And I'm always, if I find one, I'm like, Sarah, I got one for you. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't say bisexual, but it's a bisexual. <laughs> Did you guys all hear that? Yeah. Is it bisexual bisexual books blog? Tumblr? Bisexual books. Bisexual books. And it's on Tumblr. Tumblr, okay. It's also, Goodreads, Goodreads is very good as well for finding uh, whether you're looking for gay or trans or bisexual books as well. So, And people put up lists on there all the time. So. Um, I'm a public and school librarian, and I find that the best way to get the books on the shelves is just to quietly put them out and they will go out. People can find them. It's it's a nice little way to be subversive, but you know, help people at the same time. And don't, you know, I said, don't, mm -hmm. people may be tempted. A lot, they, you know, be, and that gives the kid the idea that it's abnormal if you hide it in the adult section exactly, or whatever like that. Right. Just it's in the children's the section. Just keep it with the regular books, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I I went back to the board and I said, look, this board is 70-year-old, you know, VAR, women, 
<laughs> that's, I would never ever think in a million years that there's a gay child roaming around town. <laughs> I know that there's gay children. In the high school, my, my daughter's best friends with them, and they are in the flag war, and they are doing stuff, and they are accepting each other, but we need to accept the fact that they're part of our Therefore, I want to buy X amount of books and start this. And to my absolute shock, they said, that sounds great. And, and I really be surprised. However, we do have people in the community that obviously resist, so that when I put the boys kissing out in the young adult section, it's constantly being turned around. So I still have that battle. But I just want to say the lists and everything on the handouts, they're very, very, very good. And I get a lot of good ideas from all the and some people will say, well, I don't know any gay kids that come to my library. Well, how do you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're conforming to the stereotype, you know? It's like, you know, sure, some may, you know, it, but you don't know if that person's gay, straight, or even just a straight person who's interested, you know? Yeah, I, I really um, like the idea of not ghettoizing the book somewhere just because I think a lot of people that have a real problem with this don't read much, so <laughs> so you mentioned being subversive. You know, I, I I really do. You put them out there, and you know, kids will find them, and it won't become a lightning rod. Especially if you work in a school library, you know, it can be very, you know, there can be a lot of pressure depending on, um, you know. Parent, parents in the community in particular, so. And this is why it's so important for kids to feel comfortable talking to their librarians, because otherwise, how do you know, right? Like, and actually, like, I think it's really helpful to have books as well, where it's not, like, well, you know, you can't tell from the book jacket or, or whatever, and that's, you know, like, I uh, just read a book called The Art of Wishing by Lindsay Rivard, and reading about, oh, surprise, bisexual love interest, yay! <laughs> like, I didn't even know. Yeah. And how would you know, unless you read the book, but your librarian will know. Any <laughs> question up here, and then right there. Uh, yeah, for the writers on the panel, I was wondering, um, over the past several years, with the uh, broader acceptance of the LGBT community in general, um, how do you feel that has shaped your writing, if at all, the stories that you tell? Um, I don't think the I, I don't think it's it's changed much for me in that um, it was something that was always really really important to me um, to have those characters in my books anyway. Um, none of my books I, I, I do I'll, I'll put it out there that uh, the protagonists in all of my books are straight. Um, I'm definitely of the ilk where it's 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 the best friends and and uh, and my second book. Uh, it's the parents, um, and and I do hope to. I, so if, it, if anything is shaping it, and that I, I definitely want um, to add a protagonist out there soon. But um, it was just it, there's such a it's it's a natural part of our world, right? Like all of my friends growing up, like 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 all of my role models when I was a teenager, um, they they were they were gay men, and so um, you know I I was. I was a like, deeply unhappy teenager, and I felt really, really out of place, and I didn't connect with my peers. And, and it was those, I lived in a community that had a lot of gay men, and it was those men who reached out to me and saw that I was suffering. And, you know, they, they gave me that it gets better message, you know, 15 years uh, before Dan Savage was out there. Um, and so, for me, like it, it's always been so crucial to have those characters in my books because those are the people who saved me, and those are my best friends. Um, so, so it being more accepted hasn't changed my work. Um, I'm just really grateful that it is that way. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's changed my work either. Um, I like Stephanie. Um, in my books, the protagonists aren't gay, and, and and one thing I'd like to ask the audience too, because there are differing opinions on this. You know, I'm not sure I'm the person to write a gay love story that I would do it as effectively, or a bisexual love story, or or whatever. And often you come in for criticism. You don't know, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Why are you? 
Would you be off put by the idea of a straight person writing? No, 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 no not at no, all. No, no, okay. If you're that self conscious about the issue, you are the person to write the book. Yeah, okay. it's true. I saw an interesting. <laughs> gays, gays are writing straight love stories all yeah. the time. Yeah. And there's an interesting relationship there, too. Mary Robinette Cole um, often posts on Twitter where she's looking for people of different cultures or different languages to fact check what she's written. Mm -hmm. And I think that if it's something that you're concerned about, it shouldn't be that difficult to find someone to run it by and say, hey, is this working before it gets published? And then you've covered all your bases, you know? So can I quote you guys? <laughs> when I get that email, that's uh, you know, but but yeah, I um, I have um, a number of friends and business associates who are gay. Um, I it was really important to me as a reader to find myself in the books that I read, and um, you know I've received emails from readers who say you know it was. It was just such a great surprise. Like you said, I'm reading a fantasy book and here's a character who is gay. And then of course there's a person on Goodreads that posted a review that said, do you realize there are homosexuals in this book? I just think people ought to know. All so the stories I could tell you about Goodreads. But Sina, I'm really curious because I was, uh, I, I confess, uh, I was expecting with my second book, Lola and the Boy Next Door, where the parents are uh, two gay men, and it's it's very normalized. It's zero issue. Um, it was really really important to me that it was a healthy environment and that that was never even talked about as a thing. Um, and I really really thought that in in this country, because the media is so gross and icky, I, I was afraid that that was the thing that I was going to get the the mean hateful emails about. Um, I have not received one hateful email. Um, yeah, which I think is awesome. I get hate mail because I use the F word. <laughs> That's what people get really angry about. So, you know, like, we, we need some progress on that point, but I think it's important to share with you all I've never received hate mail about about that. Have you, what's, what's your... Yeah, and, and if you're not getting hate mail as a writer, you're not doing your job. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I, I guess I, I would say that um, it, it hasn't really changed my books, but I do feel like even during the time that I've been writing, my um, ninth book is coming out this fall, um, I think now um, you're less likely to get that feedback, even from people who might feel that way. Um, it's, it's getting less and less socially acceptable to be a bigot. So, um, people don't feel as free to, but I, I have had, you know, people just say, you know, there are some of those rating sites where um, I just, they just make my skin crawl, where they go through the content of the book and nothing's in context and they like count up how many kisses and whether there's any onstage sex or, you know, whatever. And um, those sites make me laugh because when, <laughs> I, when I write my books, and like I come to those scenes that I know, like one of those like, bigger prudish baby people, like they're gonna have to actually write out that sentence that I just read. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I, I, I count the number of erections I write into my book. There you go. Plus, it's great advertising and lets everybody else who yes. you know wants to read that right? stuff know exactly where to go find it. <laughs> We did have a question right here, and then a smattering of people put their hands up all at the same time. So we'll go with her, and then start with over, like one, okay. two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> um, I found it frustrating with um, the Amazon search engine, and I work at Barnes and Noble, and that search engine is really bad too. When you type in a gay fan fiction, or uh, not fan fiction, you type in gay young adult, or you type in gay teen. It literally gives you ones that have the word gay in the title. So that the search engines suck. But if you do Google and you do protagonists and you literally go down the letters and you go protagonist, teen, lesbian, protagonist, teen, gay, protagonist, teen, bisexual, you'll get the books because everyone has their own website of, of those books and so then you'll get them all at the same time. And um, I, I work for Barnes and Noble. And um, I've made it my life goal to make sure that we always have those books in the store. And if you just tell the person at your Barnes Noble, not a muggle, 
Um, <laughs> you know, go, go to the different people at the Barnes and Noble. You can walk in and, and know instinctively who you need to talk to. You're like that shit with the horns. <laughs> and, and say, you know, um, can you have these books in your store? There's a way to go into the system and lock them in the store. If you scan any of my books in, in Barnes and Noble, they say, gay stuff don't send back. And, and, and so all of, and every time I get a new title, I add it, and they don't circulate in our store. They stay in our store. So you just got to find that person that, that is passionate about that. And um, a lot of the adults that come in that ask for um, LGBT for adults, I take them to the teen section because those books have the action and adventure and the fairies and the dragons, and they have better stories than your Adult. adult books tend to be 50 shades of gray. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stand just so I can see Sydney because I wanted to answer her question. The bulk of people who write gay romance are women by about 60% of the people who write. Well, you see my shirt. This is the only women who don't like gay romance are the ones who haven't read it. <laughs> so um, most of the women, not I, I, a lot of people say straight women. They're not all straight, but. I, more than half of the people who write and sell, and they do sell, gay romance books are women. And really the way to approach it is, is just two people. You, know, you can get the mechanics if you need to look up mechanics or anything like that, <laughs> but it's two people in love, so the gender is secondary to everything else. I, I just wanted to say uh, on the list I gave you, there are some websites like the Lambda Awards and, some, and the Rainbow Awards and stuff. Those oh, give good special. bibliographies, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, as she was saying, trying to find these books. So go to those websites, and those are peer review stuff. People review them, and I mean they're from all publishers, from e-publishers to Harmony to on up. So definitely check those sites out for books. Um, I teach elementary school students, and I TTYL series, um, I believe one of the characters has uh, lesbian parents. Um, she's been banned a lot for that book. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys think of other middle grade books? Oh, she's from that middle grade. But yeah. Easy books. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I know the good picture books too. Yeah, but, but yeah, the middle grade that books. Gets are banned all the time. And Tango yeah. makes three. Yeah. There's a there's a book by Sonia Sound. Oh, and I love the guinea pig wedding one. Do you guys know the guinea pig wedding book? It's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> Two male guinea pigs getting married, and it's about like uh, the the little girl who's like sad. She's like losing her uncle, but she's really gaining a second uncle. <laughs> I will warn you that some of the older YA lit that deals with the gay, like, uncle or something like that, that uncle tends to die in a horrible car crash, so you may want to avoid those types of things. I was thinking this morning, but I'm a little afraid. The Percy Jackson books has um, one gay character in it, Nico. He's in the second part of the series. It's listed as Y, but it's totally fine for no reason. Yeah. Can you guys think of other elementary school age you've yeah, got? Um, there's a book called, I think it's called Jennifer's Notebook. It's by uh, it IGA something. The author's last name is IGA something. And it's a series kind of like um, Big Nate or um, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And it's a girl in church. She has two dads. Um, and that's a really big seller. And then there's like five in the series now. There's What's also the a called? small um, kind of, um, there's one, it's called Ben. Ben steps out, and Ben is the star, and he's like 10 years old, 
and loves the theater and singing and dancing. Oh, Nate. Oh, Nate. Nate. Better Nate than Nate. Better Nate. Nate. Yeah. Oh, it's so cute. By Tim, Tim, <laughs> Tim Betterly? Yeah. F-E-D-R-E-L-E. Yeah, he's awesome. He's an awesome dude. Yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> awesome. one of my favorite Twitter feeds. He's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Into the back. The, the series that was just mentioned where the, one of the protagonists her father is our gay couple. It's called the Popularity Papers. Popularity Papers. Yes. Okay. Get some more questions. Oh, it can tell. Um. <laughs> I just want to mention she had her hand up like five minutes okay. ago. <laughs> I just wanted to direct Sonia Sones as one of the middle grade examples. Sonia Sones, like, she's a really, really popular middle grade author if you haven't read her. Her books are really fun, and she has a book called One of Those Hideous Books Where the Mother Dies. Oh, yeah. Um, and the whole, the whole plot of that book is about her essentially, like the kid, uh, her mother dies, she has to go live with her father, she, who she's been sort of estranged from, and he's like a Hollywood celebrity. Um, so the whole like course of the book is her figuring out that her dad and her mother divorced because her dad was gay, um, and having to come to church like, and it's it's really sweet. So that's all. Right here, right there, and then right there, and then along the same lines. Um, the book called My Most Excellent Year, which my oldest loves, and I love because it's about three main characters, one of whom is gay. And I think she's reading some of that. She's now fourteen, but she's read it. She's read it like since she was ten because her little brother. Is gay, so it's really helped. Like, and I will tell you, seven. So I'm like, yeah, I have to be here. Um, <laughs> so I mean, I, that kind of thing has helped her to understand. I, I realized that I'm late to the party, but one of the first books that I was recommended to me was actually by my sociology professor when I first started attending college. It was listed as a full-on adult series, as an adult book, but it was called The Front Runner. And uh, it had a subsequent uh, novel called Harlan's Race, where it was um, a coach who was repressing himself, so it is a bit issue concentric. And then the runner that he was required to train, along with his two friends, all three of them ended up being gay, and he had to come to terms with himself and kind of re, re mature along with the three of the, the younger runners. And so that, that was one of the earliest novels that kind of introduced genre and uh, in regards to one of the three protagonists they even made mention to him growing in a progressive uh, household where there were two fathers but one was female identified and would dress as a female um, in, in the household so the, the, the fact that he was so used to it and it wasn't for him at all was a nice little dichotomy there too. And that was adult fiction? Yeah. yeah. Cool. I was going to say, um, this summer I read The Song of Achilles, which is the whole Trojan War story from Patroclus' standpoint, which means you get lots of gay sex between Patroclus and Achilles, except it's new fiction, so it's like, it's like showtime sex. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a woman, and so you, you should go ahead. My other, my question though was, is there more of that sort of historical fiction type of stuff in gay sex? Because I, I, it wasn't well written, but I really enjoyed the book. <laughs> we have two. Uh, one's called Valhalla by James Eric, and the other is Beloved Pilgrim by Christopher Hawthorne Moss. Valhalla is a uh, gay, and Beloved Pilgrim is a uh, trans man. Yeah, the vast majority of this fiction is what, what they call realistic fiction, which is like John Green fiction, is what I call it. Um, and then uh, a far distant second place is science fiction and fantasy, and then all other genres are in a distant, very distant third. So it's, it's. I can think of a few historical series where like they're in the background. Like I, I know in the Outlander series, there are a few here and there, but I, I'm trying to think. He's oh yeah, the Jewish Lord Islam. John Gray. Yeah. yeah, that's an awesome series. The Lord John Gray series, it's by Diana Gabaldon, and uh, they're mysteries, and the protagonist is, is gay. Philip Gregory's, uh, oh, yeah. Travis. Philip Gregory, Gregory. Philippa Gregory. Philippa which one? Gregory, the, the Travis, she, she went on a side track about the gardener, the royal gardener. Oh, nice. Um, the Travis Scant books. Travis Scant books, Philip Gregory. Right here, and then Alexa. Alexa, do you have a question? <laughs> I just had a question. Um, so I'm a YA librarian, and 
One of my favorite LGBTQ books that I've read in the last year was Jumpstart the World, which if you guys haven't read, it's um, a girl that moves next door to a, her neighbor in the apartment complex. She gets very close to it and finds out that they're trans. And it sort of throws her for a loop. She's never been exposed to that. And it's her kind of, she's not bigoted, she's not, but she's just having to think through everything. It's really interesting, nice first exposure. But trying to give that book to anyone who isn't LGBTQ is really frustrating, despite the fact that you're going, no, but the plot is good and the writing's excellent. It's just a really enjoyable novel. And they're going, but I don't. In the midst of like a, a long conversation about boys specifically not wanting to read anything that is not clearly targeted as a boy book for boys by boys. Um, what do you guys think the importance is not just having LGBTQ books for gay and lesbian and trans <laughs> teens, but for the straight teen readers just as far as exposure? Very important. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I would suggest is if you have any book talks or anything like that. Lots of book talks. Yeah, definitely schedule one of those books as a book talk, and uh, just uh, and just be very, you know, don't say this is a gay book or a straight book. You know, as you said, it's a good book with a good plot. Mark, target it that way, and then let them see what they think of it after they read it. Definitely. I'd say that unless it's actually a plot point that the character is gay, don't say anything. They don't say anything when the character's straight. Yeah, I agree. That's that's why I get frustrated with the categorization of books when people say this is a boy book, this is a girl book, this is a, a gay book, but they never say this is a straight book because all books are straight books, or at least unless they include gay people, apparently. But <laughs> it, it, yeah, I mean, um, <coughs> my objective always is to write a good story first, and make the reader fall in love with my characters. And hopefully it doesn't matter um, if they don't match up with the reader in terms of their sexual orientation. Um, I've been wondering, are there any good books with non-binary representation in them? Like by gender or, or like pansexual? Like genderqueer, intersex, like anything. Yeah, that's what my question was. <laughs> Whatever Happened to Lonnie Garver is an older book, but it's a person, a teenager who comes to town and no one can decide if they're a boy, if they're a girl, or whichever gender they are, if they're straight or they're gay, and then that character disappears and it's everyone sort of having a discussion in their wake. But it's Whatever Happened to Lonnie Garver, and I don't think the question was ever answered. They're just more of a, they're just, they're there and then they're not and then the discussion takes place afterwards. Pantomime. <laughs> yeah, Pantomime, the Pantomime series is an intersexual character. It, in fact, the blurb is kind of misleading because you yes. think it's a romance between a, a boy and a girl, and the boy and the girl are the same person. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a, um, this is a quite answer to that question. There's a book by um, Steve Rezanoff called Brooklyn Burning that you never find out the gender of the character because it's completely irrelevant. Which is which is really interesting. So they could, it could be a straight couple, it could be a gay couple. You have no idea throughout the whole book. Yeah, it's it's yeah. <laughs> Just um, it was, it's not really a question. It's when I was a teenager growing up. I grew up in a biased town and. There, but there was a gender and sexuality section in the bookstore. The problem was there was also a teen section. These were two very different sections. And every single book that is indeed considered a YA novel of any variety, if it had a gay character in it, it was in the gender and sexuality, along with the nonfiction and the issue books and everything else. And what can teens do, especially my little sister, for instance? How can I struggle? She's struggling. What can we do to to combat that? It, yeah, if a bookstore has it, I would definitely take it up with the bookstore because that's you know that's definitely wrong. Um, I can't imagine a library doing that. Well, yeah, I can't imagine a library. Doing that. <laughs> um, 
de it's definitely something that shouldn't be. And like I said, that's is where the librarian, if it's in a library, the librarian has to be proactive. And if your librarian is at prejudice, it's it's really hard. But you know, because it's hard enough for the teens to come out and say, or or you know, the the, the tweens or whatever. And it's really up for, for the librarian to say, you know, these are YA books, these are fiction books, or issue books, whatever. They need to be in the YA section where the teens can find them. They're not in the adult section. They're not, you know, hidden away behind the desk. You know, they're, you know, that's, that's, it's definitely an issue that has to be dealt with. I think there's a trade-off, though. At least, you know, when in the 90s, before we had the, the full value of Google, at least if they were in the, the gay section, I knew where to go. And I didn't have to look at every single book jacket. I just had to wait until no one was standing there. <laughs> <laughs> so mine's kind of like past and future. Um, jumping on the, our language is a very binary language. It's he, her, she, him. So with the them like has have you really seen a growing awareness through publishing or being a writer using those pronouns a publisher editor bringing them in and like we have, uh, we did an anthology recently um, where we actually asked um, young writers, age 14 to 21, to submit short stories for it. Um, and then we, we gave professional feedback to every single story that we got and um, published the best of them. And one of the stories that we published actually used uh, the, I'm not sure how to say it, the Z-I-E, Z, yeah, yeah, Z, yeah, how, <laughs> Z, um, Z -er. Z -er, yeah um, used, used those pronouns. Um, I think we have something else in one of our anthologies that uses they, them. Um, I mean, as a publisher, if those are the pronouns that the author chooses to use for their characters, we absolutely let them keep them in. We're gonna respect that. Um. I mean, it's an identity that you can choose on Facebook. It's not like that's gonna surprise anybody. Right, like, well, yeah. Um, and I know just, just on Tumblr, you know, there's definitely a growing awareness of they, them as a singular pronoun, and it is actually in the the, it, it is actually in the Chicago Manual of Style that you can use it as a singular pronoun. So, um, you know, if anybody tries to tell you that it's not, tell them that the Chicago Manual of Style says that it is. <laughs> um. I, I can't think of the book. I know one book avoids the question by simply using the person's name throughout the novel rather than the he, she uh, thing. And they just say, you know, um, that person's name throughout the novel. The way that uh, Brooklyn Burning does it is one of the characters in first person and, and second person. So it's you and I, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not seeing a lot of it yet, but what I'm hearing from editors themselves are that they want it and they're looking for it. And so um, it's it, it's people like us who, who need to write it and give it to them. Like they, they really want to publish it. There are not a lot of books. Um, with with trans characters or, or anyone who would use the they pronoun like if they're you yeah. know we're getting like in traditional publishing in YA we're we're getting like two trans books a year maybe like it's it's not a lot yeah and out. and I mean I see all the time people are complaining why why aren't these books out there and you know I hate to be like well you need you need to write them but the fact is I can only publish what somebody sends to me so you know and uh, so. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, I personally on Tumblr, I try to be very encouraging to anybody who's, who's trying to be a writer because we need people to write these stories and if the people who are currently writing and being published aren't going to write these stories, then new writers need to start writing. Um, and there are, you know, we want to publish them, there's other publishers that want to publish them. Um, you know, even the big six are willing, are starting to be willing to publish these things. So, you know, it, it's really up to the community to start writing them. Um, and submitting them. And I, I think that that would likely be a very strong book. The other thing, um, if there are two books um, published each year, um, support those books. You know, find out about them, buy them, talk them up, because um, at the end of the day, it, one thing you do hear from some publishers is, well, I don't know, you know, it's a niche market or, you know. So, yeah, and, and um, that is an issue because YA is a niche, LGBTQA is a niche, and then especially when you're getting into, it's also fantasy or science fiction or paranormal or historical, that's yet another niche. So every time you add something like that, you are narrowing your potential market. 
and so publishers, a lot of publishers are less willing to take chances on those books. Um, so you really do need to get out there and buy them, check them out of the library if you don't have money, request them from your library if your library doesn't have them, that's, a, that's another big thing, you know. Let your librarians and let your bookstores know that these books will circulate because if the books sell and the books circulate, then more publishers are gonna put them out. I had a question more for the publishers and the librarian. Um, with, yay, yay. Yay. Um, people are talking about having the books pulled out in a separate section and how that both encourages because they know where to find it, but discourages because then you're getting from that section. Um, but if you don't mark them in any way, it's really hard to find them. How do you guys go about marketing these books? Because I know in our library, people have recommended, we've had it on both sides, the readers recommend putting a sticker on it so they can find it easier, but then we know that if if your parents or such don't want you checking them out and it's clearly marked, like how do you guys come down on that? Bookmarks uh, <laughs> that say, well, no, no, I, I, you know, this is, and I've got some articles in that for more that are more professionally that you're welcome to have. Uh, definitely like, a, like, a, you know, something definitely along those lines that doesn't, that they can just pick it up and stick it in their pocket, that list titles that they might be interested in, but at the same time doesn't have this big blurry sticker like gay fiction. Yes. You know? <laughs> and so, yeah, something along those lines. And you can do a display and just say, just, and you know, maybe no one will check out for the display, but make, at least you, they know that you've got these materials in the library. And then you can, you know, at the end of the month, just switch out the display. Also, don't underestimate the power of the internet, um, especially you know if you're a library that lends ebooks. Um, you know that makes it that makes it really easy if, if you if you can lend ebooks. Um, but you know, like when, when we put our books out there, we are sure to label them both as LGBTQ and as you know just romance or fantasy or whatever, so that they're going to come up in both searches. They're going to show up in both categories on Amazon. They're going to show up in all the cat you know both categories on on Barnes and Noble or wherever wherever people are are looking for them um and, and it really is a lot of it comes down to the librarians and the booksellers um you know because we'll put the information in our marketing materials you know it's obvious that these books are lgbtq books um and it's up to the librarians and the booksellers to to know so that when the kids come up and say do you have any of these you can say yes you know here's some um, and then, you know, like what he said with, with, you know, displays or bookmarks or just something little to, to let people know without, without being flashy because you are going to get, you know, there are still places and people who, who can't read these books, um, who can't take them home, um, so. Okay, we have around 10 minutes left, so we have time for three questions that I've acknowledged before. So, the lady with the horns from Barnes & Noble, right here in the corner, and a little right there. Yeah. Working at a bookstore, I have a lot of African American people come to me and they're like, Where's your black fiction? No, no more segregation. We, like, <laughs> once you separate the books, then, then it's other. It's different from all the other books. It's no longer fiction. It doesn't deserve to be with fiction. It's off to the side. And it's usually in the back or in the front. And it just irks me to know it. I'm not a fan of I totally agree. Don't Absolutely. It's important for you as a bookseller to know you know, some titles to recommend to them that, that are black fiction or gay fiction or, or whatever, but separating them just is, that's that's not gonna help with acceptance, that's not gonna get the straight readers or the white readers or whatever to pick up the book and discover that, hey, this is a really good story about somebody who just happens to be different from me. And there are uh, visual traits and so many other genres, but there aren't with LGBTQ books. So in a teen section, if there is a male and a female character on the cover of the book, boom, boom, will be happening. <laughs> and African American books, they tend to put someone brown on the spine, or they use African American colors. It's like a purple, red, green. Like, you can pick out African American books just by looking at a shelf and be like that and that and that. But there isn't really a visual cue for the for that, and that would be awesome. Like nothing like crazy, like let's just put a giant rainbow stripe. <laughs> <laughs> if there was something where you could look at the cover of a book. <laughs> this does a good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 that award. Yeah, the, the Lando award, award too. Yeah. Okay, sir. I just wanted to recommend that I got. I'm looking for a historical picture. Yeah, um, there's one called Michael Jensen. 
to that's the other end of the frontier. And it's a gay love story that takes place in the American you know, West in 1797. And it's probably the best what gay love story I've ever read. I've given it to female friends, and it's got sex in it, but it's not graphic. They're like, this book hot. <laughs> Straight that, females love, love reading hot gay sex. <laughs> 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 Alright, right here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, outside, I mean, I don't see a lot of, in general, I don't see a lot of YA short stories outside of, like, scary stories to read in the dark and, um, you know, like, the occasional Aaron Culver story ends up in just an anthology of fantasy. So, in general, is there any place that has YA LGBT stories, or takes them, or a place where I can find them, because sometimes short stories are a little bit easier, because I can read one at the lunch. So I recommended a book earlier, there's some copies up here, it's uh, gay YA fairy tales, short stories, called Red Caps by Steve Furman, um, and that press, Lef A, I think has also published, usually small presses, like you, Harmony does some anthologies, right? We have two anthologies, we have several, I guess it depends on what, what your definition of short is, <laughs> because I found that that varies a lot between, between people, um, I mean we have some novellas that are around 18 to 20,000 words long, um, so I guess that depends on how fast you read, if you can read one of those at lunch. I was thinking like maybe somewhere around um, we do have our two anthologies. Um, another place I would recommend is the, um, the gay, I don't remember, it's the Goodreads group. There, there's a, um, there is a Goodreads group for gay YA and the name is eluding me at the moment. But a lot of, a lot of the Goodreads groups do, uh, short story things, um, so you can get, and they're, they're not necessarily professionally published, um, but people will, authors will write short stories and post them on these various Goodreads groups. Um, a lot of the, the groups have like story things, so that might be a good place to, to go. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that short stories and anthologies just don't sell as well, um, so publishers aren't really willing to, you know, it, it doesn't take me any more effort, much more effort to edit a 20,000 word story than a 5,000 word story, and it's the same amount of production effort. Um, but I, you know, the 20,000 word story is going to sell, and the 5,000 word story really isn't. So, you know, there's obviously obvious which one I'm going to dedicate my time to. There's there's one author who I would love to recommend to you, and that's Francesca Lea Block, and she writes. Um, not only does she write very short novels, but she also does have write short stories and has several short story collections, and she features uh, the full range of sexuality in her books. Yeah, also, she's fantastic. Sorry. Um, you can also look for like the the winners of the Lambda Awards every year because these aren't YA necessarily, but there might be. So you can see like the nominees for best short story that year and best novella that year, and some of them can be appropriate for teams. Okay, I'm well, just curious: are there short stories, um, e-books, um, e-shorts available that are findable? Yes. Um, yeah. 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 Already out, some are currently still taking submissions, and they, there's, a, there's fairy tales, there is, like, any kind of the various, like, steampunk ass genres, um, and, and they're all ebooks. So, yeah, that's a good place to look if you're looking for... Riptide? Riptide. 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 Okay, um, we do have to end, unfortunately. We <laughs> have some few things to take care of first. I would like to thank all of our panelists. Um,